All right, let's get right into it. Today, we're tackling one of the most fundamental processes in biology, how life reads its own instruction manual. We're talking about transcriptional initiation. Basically, how does a cell sift through a massive DNA library to find the exact starting line of one single gene? We'll break down the two major strategies life uses to solve this puzzle, comparing the lean, mean, prokaryotic system with a much more complex eukaryotic one. Now, this is a huge topic, especially if you're prepping for exams like the CSI or NET, so this is definitely core stuff you'll want to lock in. So, let's frame the problem here. Imagine you have a library with millions of books, but none of them has covers or titles, and you need to find the first word of a specific chapter inside one of those books. That's pretty much the challenge a cell faces. It's got to scan this enormous sea of genetic code to find the precise spot to begin transcribing a gene. So, how on earth does it do that with such incredible accuracy? That's the big question we're going to answer. So first up, let's look at the prokaryotic way of doing things. Think bacteria. Their entire strategy is built around two things, speed and specificity. They need to be fast, efficient, and super responsive to their environment. And the absolute star of this whole show is a little protein subunit called the sigma factor. Okay, this is a really critical point you have to get straight. The difference between what we call the core enzyme and the holoenzyme. The core RNA polymerase, by itself, is a bit clueless. Yeah, it can bind to DNA, but it does so totally randomly. It has no idea where a gene actually begins. But when it partners up with a sigma factor, boom, it becomes the holoenzyme. And now it's a completely different beast. It's a precision-guided machine that can hunt down and lock onto a gene's promoter. That transformation from a random binder to a specific initiator is everything. So what is this sigma factor? Honestly, the best way to think of it is as a GPS for the RNA polymerase. It's this little detachable guide that knows the specific address, the promoter sequence, on the DNA where a gene starts. It latches onto the core enzyme, takes it to the right spot, helps it get started, and then it just pops off to be used again. So efficient. Let's just walk through this nice and clear. Step one, the sigma factor joins the core enzyme. Now we have our hollow enzyme. Step two, this complex starts sliding along the DNA, just scanning. Step three is the magic moment. The sigma subunit recognizes two key landing strips, the negative 35 sequence and the negative 10 sequence, which you might know as the Pribnow box. This recognition brings everything to a halt, positioning the polymerase perfectly at the start site. Then, transcription begins, and once it's underway, the sigma factor's job is done. It's released and recycled, ready to guide another polymerase. Just a beautiful, elegant cycle. Now, for most of its day-to-day -day life, a bacterium like E. coli relies on one main sigma factor, that's sigma-70. You can think of it as the housekeeping sigma. It handles all the essential everyday genes, the stuff needed for growth, metabolism, just basic survival when conditions are good. But what happens when conditions aren't good? What if there's a sudden heat wave or the food runs out? The cell can't just keep making the same old housekeeping proteins. It needs a completely different set of tools to survive. It has to pivot and it has to do it fast. And this is the genius of the prokaryotic system. How do they pivot? They just swap out the guide. The cell stops using the generalist, sigma-70, and starts producing a specialist. If it gets too hot, it makes sigma-32, which directs the polymerase only to the heat shock genes. If it's starving, it calls in sigma-38. See the pattern? By simply changing the sigma factor, the cell can redirect its entire transcriptional program almost instantly. It's a brilliant strategy for rapid adaptation. Okay, let's switch gears completely. We're now moving into the eukaryotic world. And if the prokaryotic system was a nimble speedboat, the eukaryotic system is a massive aircraft carrier. It's slower, requires a huge crew, but it allows for an unbelievable level of precision and control. Right off the bat, the first layer of complexity is that eukaryotes don't have one RNA polymerase, they have three, and each one has a very specific job. Polymerase I is for making ribosomal RNA. Polymerase 3 handles transfer RNA and other small RNAs. The one we're really going to focus on is RNA polymerase 2, because that's the one that transcribes all the protein coding genes into messenger RNA. Now here's a huge difference. Eukaryotic RNA polymerase 2 is completely helpless on its own. It has zero ability to find a promoter. It needs a whole team of other proteins to come in first and prepare the site for it. We call these the general transcription factors, or GTFs and they are the absolute bare minimum requirement to even get the process started. The way this works is that these GTFS assemble on the promoter one by one, 
The process usually kicks off when a part of the TFI ID complex, called the TATA binding protein, finds and latches onto the TATA box in the promoter. This creates the initial foothold, and it's a signal for all the other GTFs to come and join the party, building this big protein platform. Only when that landing pad is fully assembled can RNA polymerase II be recruited to the site. So, if the GTFs are the basic on-off switch, the Specialized Transcription Factors, or STFs, are the dimmer switches. They provide the all-important fine-tuning. These are the proteins that allow a skin cell to be a skin cell and a neuron to be a neuron. They respond to all sorts of signals to either crank up transcription of a gene or shut it down completely. This is where the real regulation happens. And what's just mind-blowing is that these STFs don't even have to be anywhere near the gene they control. They can bind to DNA sequences called enhancers that might be thousands, even tens of thousands of base pairs away. So how do they influence what's happening at the start site? The DNA itself actually has to physically bend and loop around, bringing that distant enhancer and its bound STF into direct physical contact with the machinery at the promoter. So what connects that distant STF to the crew at the promoter? That's the job of another massive protein machine called the mediator complex. Think of it as the ultimate communication hub. It forms a physical bridge between the regulatory signals coming from the specialized factors and the core machinery with the GTFs and RNA polymerase II. It integrates all of this information to tell the polymerase, okay, go now, or wait, or go really, really fast. All right, let's pull all this together and put these two systems head to head. Seeing them side by side like this really makes the differences pop. And for anyone studying for an exam, this kind of direct comparison is the absolute best way to lock in these concepts. This table really tells the whole story. On the prokaryotic side, you see a system built for one thing, a rapid response. One polymerase, a simple sigma factor for targeting, and transcription and translation happen at the same time. It's all about speed. In contrast, look at eukaryotes. It's all about control and regulation. A whole committee of proteins, three different polymerases, and a physical separation of tasks between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. All these extra steps provide multiple checkpoints for fine-tuning gene expression, which is absolutely essential for building a complex, multicellular organism. So, if you're making flashcards, here are the key takeaways. For prokaryotes, think simple, fast, efficient. One polymerase, one type of guide, the sigma factor. For eukaryotes, think complex, layered, precise. Three polymerases and a whole committee of factors, GTFs, STFs, and mediator. And their regulatory strategies are totally different. Prokaryotes regulate by swapping the entire guide. Eukaryotes use a complex network of dimmer switches for much more nuanced control. And that really brings us to a final, bigger question. This split between the prokaryotic need for speed and the eukaryotic need for complex control, it's not just a random biochemical detail, is it? It's a fundamental reflection of two completely different evolutionary strategies for life. One is for a single-celled organism that has to react to its environment in an instant. The other is for building a complex, multicellular being where every cell has to play its specific part perfectly. It's evolution's story written in the machinery of the cell. Thanks for joining me.